Welcome to Sleepy Head Stories today. We love to read books, be silly, and play. Me and my mommy are here every week to read you great stories that all are unique. Join us at bedtime, or bath time, or breakfast. We promise it's better than a trip to the dentist. Welcome to Sleepy Head Stories. Happy Valentine's Day! Happy Valentine's Day, guys. Well, tomorrow's Make Valentine's Day, but... Right, tomorrow's Valentine's Day. But it's probably going to be uploaded, like, on Valentine's Day, right? Yeah, it'll be uploaded before then, so... Hi, guys! <coughs> so, we have a special episode this week. Um, first, we're going to talk about Valentine's Day real quick. Yeah. Conchetta has made a pretty big project, and maybe you do this in your school too. Conchetta had to make a what? Got a good look? Okay, let's. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not enough. Come on, show them right. And explain it to them. So, Conchetta had to make a Valentine's Day box to hold all of her Valentine she's going to get. And there was specific instructions. The box had to be a certain... No, like explain it, like what the theme is. Oh, so Conchetta's theme, because we had to have a special hole size. I'll explain it to them. Yeah, I think it's better. Go you ahead. hold it. I'll hold it. So they can see top Here, and I'll, bottom. I'll hold like that. So it's, so my theme is like, it's where um, a, Pegas, um, a Pegasus and Cupid are meeting each other for the first time, mm -hmm. and they have like their army of hearts and their army of ra of rainbows, mm -hmm. and um, love, which is the hearts, plus happiness, which is the rainbows, equals Valentine's Day. Yeah. And this is both of them combined up here. Yeah, and we have Conchetta's... Oops. You guys, that? name up here, and here's her hole big enough to put some nice gifts inside and candies and cards We're and gonna, things. My friend, um, they made a Mario Odyssey one. Yeah, so there's also a contest in her class, um, all different kinds of contests. Most creative and stuff. Most creative, most colorful. I can't most... wait to see what other people are going to do. Yeah, I think some people. And, I and... heard my friend was doing a fly, flying pig in a microwave. But um, Conchetta had to do, uh, parents were allowed to help because it's a little bit hard, some of the construction things. Like, mo because mommy had to bake these. Yeah, I baked the clay in the oven. But she came up with the concept. She came up with the idea. I think it was a pretty good one. I think you have a good chance. Yeah. But what's more exciting is all the Valentines you're going to get inside. Yeah. That's the best part of it all. I hope so, I get some candy. I'm sure you will get candy. And then what What are the Valentines you're going to give out? Want Ducks. me to show them? We're giving out ducks, 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 ducks. We are giving ducks. out. We did the same thing last year. Um, we have a lot of rubber ducks. That's a hold whole on, other hold story. Hold on, I want to. Wait. So we're giving out little rubber ducks. Each rubber duck is a different design. Wait, I want to show them the duck I gave to my friend. And she gives one to each of her classmates that she's picked out for her classmate in particular. Who's Kate? Oh boy, I don't know if you can find that. And they say on it. You quack me up. You quack me up. Dad. It says two K R and that's me and Kate. That's her best friend at school. Very nice. She's my best friend. So we're all prepared. We even have a Valentine for the teacher. Kate is watching this. Shout out to you. You're famous now. Kate's famous. Oh my god. So there you go. Let us know if you guys are doing anything fun on Valentine's Day. Go to our Instagram. Drop us a message. Send us pictures. But this week, we're not reading a book about Valentine's Day. We aren't? We are not. Um, because it's Valentine's Day, but also the whole month of February is something called Black History Month, right? Mm -hmm. I wanted to read you a great story about a man called Manza Musa. Mama Bushka. And remember what I what we learned about Manza Musa? No. He's okay. You remember? <laughs> now I remember. Yes. So I'm going to show you a picture of him here. Manza Musa lived a really long time ago, He's like super rich. over 700, 800 years ago. 
And he is, or was, one of the most richest men that ever lived. Richer than anyone that's even alive today. Where is that? This is in um, West Africa. So he was the mm -hmm. king of a West African country look, called Mali, region called Mali. It look like a bit like um, Africa. Mm -hmm. West Africa. And um, so we're going to learn all about him. Isn't it supposed to be like... And this is a really cool magazine if you guys are ever interested. Sp Cricket Magazine, the so Spider nice. Edition. You guys might like that. So we're going to learn all about Manza Musa. Manza Mushka. And not only was he very rich, but he was also very smart. And he was also very wise. And he was also very beloved by his people. So we're going to learn all about that. Okay? okay? Since it is the season of love. He was very much loved. If you can't tell what this is, it's a heart. Right. All right, guys, so let's get into it. We're going to listen right now. Yes. Talk to you next week. Goodbye. Manza Musa's Wisdom by Robert Walton. Art by Valerie Sokolova. Manza Musa stood upon a high balcony and looked down upon his city. Niani stretched beneath Molly's late morning sunshine like a lion relaxing powerful and unhurried. A caravan of camels carrying slabs of salt from the Tagaza mines wound along Goat Herder's Lane. Smoke from cooking fires drifted above the tents of merchants in the market plaza. Beyond the city's walls, fields bursting with green abundance spread south and north to the great river. Glimmering in the distance, all was well. Children's voices raised in something other than play sounded nearby. Manza Musa recognized his son's voice among the chorus. He turned, walked down a stairway, and came upon a group of boys on the patio below his balcony. He stopped in the shadow of the doorway. Magan shouted, I should go first because I am the king's son. Besides, I'm the strongest here. Strong as a crocodile's breath, muttered Ibrahim, his friend. Mangan whirled and raised his fist. Manza Musa stepped out of the shadow. All the boys looked up. Mangan's fist froze in midair. The king stood staring his gaze as heavy as that of a lion choosing his prey. At last, he said, Mungin, I will speak with you. All the boys, except Mungin, scattered like birds before a sandstorm. Mungin took a few steps towards his father, stopped, and looked down. Manza Musa rested a heavy hand upon Mungin's shoulder. My son, do you know the Jerboa? Puzzled, Mangan looked up. That skinny rat with big ears and fluff on the end of its tail? The very same. It's a miserable creature, cowardly and ugly. Do you know how it came to be as it is? Mangan shrugged. No, father. Listen. Long ago, when all animals could talk, Jerboa looked quite different. His tail was covered with silky fur, gold banded with ivory. No more magnificent tail existed, and Jerboa knew it. He raised his tail and waved it in the air, flaunting it like a flag so other animals might see its colors and feel envy. Clever Sandcat, thinking about his own fluffy but rather modest tail, became irritated with Jerboa's pride. One day, he went to Jerboa and said, You are beautiful. You have the most wonderful tail of all. Of course. Do you wish to become known as the wisest and bravest animal as well? Jerboa nodded. 
What can I do to make everyone understand how superior I am? Look below you. What do you see? Jerboa looked. I see the river people gathered around a pile of sticks. They are trying to make the sticks burn, but cannot. Jerboa shrugged. So? They long to possess fire. Only you can help them. Jerboa's tail swished back and forth. How? I know nothing about fire. Sandcat leaned in close as if to whisper a secret. The people beyond the mountain have fire. You might steal it from them and then bring it here. Steal it? Certainly. Aside from being beautiful, you are not the fastest creature of all. Jerboa's dainty pointed ears perked up. Of course I am. Then simply dash through their fire. The flames will see your wondrous tail and will be so enchanted that they will follow you here. Hmm, perhaps you are right, said Jerboa. I am right, Sandcat smiled at his own cleverness. Then the river people will praise you ten times more than they do now. Yes, Jerboa twirled with excitement, his tail scattering sunlight as he imagined the river people's cheers. That night, Jerboa crouched behind the mountain people's huts. A roaring fire burned in the center of the village. Its breath hissed and spit. Jerboa felt doubt as he looked at the mighty fire. But then, Sandcat's words returned to him. Praise! With that thought, he streaked toward the fire and leapt high. Yellow fingers of flame grabbed at his tail. But he sailed between them and landed on the ground running. Jerboa ran hard but felt a strange tingling and heard an angry crackling. He looked over his shoulder. Fire was right behind him. He ran harder, up the mountain and then down the mountain. But the fire's eager fingers reached closer and the stinging grew. He dashed into the village of the river people and crashed into their pile of sticks. It burst into flames. From that moment on, they possessed fire. Then, Jerboa ran squealing around the burning sticks, his tail sparkling like a comet. The river people froze with surprise and concern until a grandmother snatched up a gourd and doused him with water. Staring at the dripping, singed Jerboa, they burst into laughter and fell rolling upon the ground. My son, is Jerboa's tail glorious now? Manza Musa asked. Magan shook his head. Not at all. Manza Musa folded his heavy arms over his chest. Now you know why. Also, his ears grew large from listening for the crackle of the fire behind him. Is this true, father? Yes. Manza Munza leaned forward. What lesson might you learn from this tale? Magan shrugged. Not to catch my tail on fire? Think! Magan said nothing. Manza Musa growled. Pride! Bloated pride cost Jerboa his beautiful tail. Pride? Sandcat fooled him easily by using his pride against him. He was so proud of his handsome tail that he thought its beauty was eternal. He was so confident of his speed that he thought nothing could, catch, could match it. Fire matched it and took his tail. Magan nodded slowly. A king must never be fooled by pride. Magan studied the glow golden medallion larger than a leopard's paw. On his father's broad chest, the thick bands of gold all around his arms. 
Is not wearing so much gold on your body a sign of pride, Father? Not at all. I wear my people's gold to show them their own wealth. Is that the secret of being a great king? It is one. Mansa Musa clasped his hands behind him and walked away from his son. Magan called after him, Father, do you know other stories? Manza Munza turned and smiled. Many, he said. In 1324, Manza Musa traveled across the Sahara to the holy city of Mecca. He brought as many as 60,000 people, about 100 camels, and enough goats and sheep to feed the group. He also packed a lot of gold. Some say each camel carried 300 pounds of it. Who was Manza Musa and what kind of trip required all those people and so much stuff? Manza Musa ruled the Mali Empire in West Africa in the early 1300s. He may be the richest person who has ever lived. You think your favorite athlete or singer, the Queen of England and Amazon's founder, have lots of money? Not compared to Manza Musa. His fortune would be like having an estimated $400 billion today. Manza Musa's enormous wealth came from his empire's natural resources and important location. At the time, North Africans and Europeans used gold for coins, jewelry, and decorations, but these places didn't have enough gold to meet the huge demand. West Africa did. In the 1300s, West Africa produced about half of all the gold in Europe, Asia, and Africa. By law, Manza Musa owned all the empire's gold nuggets. He let his subjects keep the gold dust. The Mali Empire didn't get rich just from owning gold. It also made money from trade, ivory, animal skins, gold dusts, and other goods. Copper, salt, and others traveled south. In parts of West Africa, salt was as valuable as gold because the area below the Sahara didn't have much of it, and humans need to eat salt to survive. The empire earned money by charging fees on goods traveling through its territory. All this money paid for Manza Musa's extravagant trip to Mecca in 1324. As a Muslim, he was obligated to make the trip. The lavish show was his idea. He wanted the world to know about his empire. Tens of thousands of royal court members, soldiers, and all kinds of people were dressed in silk finery and draped with gold, moved through the desert, villages, and cities. They must have awed everyone along the way. Manza Musa didn't just show off his wealth. He spent it generously. As he traveled, Manza Musa gave out gold to both the poor and the wealthy. In the city of Cairo, Manza Musa gave every official a bundle of gold. What a gift! Every Friday, the group rested. Some say Manza Musa built a mosque, a place of worship, wherever they stopped. Despite bringing over a ton of gold, Manza Musa ran out of gold on his trip. He gave away so much that he needed a loan just to get back home. No problem, he easily repaid it. News of Manza Musa's extraordinary journey reached far beyond Africa. Manza Musa's trip changed the world throughout of West, all of West Africa. His trip also changed West Africa itself. The group traveled for about two years and 6,000 miles. On his return, Manza Musa brought architects, scholars, and books. He used them to enrich his empire. He built beautiful buildings and promoted learning. In the city of Tumbuktu, Manza Musa built the Dijindubir Mosque, which is still used today, 700 years later. He also built and filled libraries with books. 
In 1337, Manza Munza died. After Manza Musa's reign, more scholars and books came to Timbuktu. It became an important place for religious and scientific study. By the late 1400s, the Mali Empire had weakened. Its leaders fought too much for it to remain strong. Hundreds of years later, violence threatened Timbuktu's treasures. Beginning in 2012, the city's librarians smuggled hundreds of thousands of books to safety. Their heroic efforts show the importance of what Manza Musa started. Facts about Manza Musa can be sketchy, but Manza Musa's legend and legacy lives on. He was a ruler famous for his wealth. He was also known for his generosity. His gold-laden journey through Africa made his empire famous, just as Manza Musa had intended. Thank you for listening to this episode of Sleepyhead Stories. Remember, you can now watch this episode on Spotify or YouTube. We are also still available on all major podcast platforms. Be sure to send in those shout outs. Where are you from? What's your favorite book? You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and even TikTok. Thank you for listening and have a great day or night.